Stay tuned to the end of the video, comic fam. We're giving away this torpedo. Exclusive Detective Comics 1000 by Jim Lee. Comic fam, it's good to see you today. Podcast number, which one did we say it was? 34? 34, on the way to 1 million one day. Subscribe to the channel, comic fam, sitting at the table, the table? The table, like I do every week. That's a chair table for you guys. It's a chair table with the Overstreet Price Guide advisor, Jeff, the Golden Age Guru. What's up, guys, man? We got a good show here. You know, as usual, we got a lot of fun stuff that's off the cuff, and uh, you're going to find a lot of great information, I think, in this podcast specifically. We're going to be breaking open a slab, checking out some restoration that has been done from like over 20 years ago. We're going to dissect the Golden Age comic today. I talked to a restoration expert. We're going to get into some serious details and terminology and things you need to know. We're going to look at it firsthand. But we also have some Marvel DC keys we need to discuss. I'm pretty stoked about that. We got Fire Guy Ryan on the show chat and Batman Beyond. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. And let's jump into this show with breaking open a Golden Age comic book. What do you got there, Jeff? Yeah, the book we're going to crack out here is War Against Crime number 11. Oof. Yeah, this is a classic EC book. Um, it's the first uh, EC horror cover and the second appearance of the Vault Keeper. Vault Keeper is a major horror character from the 1950s. Can you explain how his impact? Yeah, so most people know the Crypt Keeper from Tales of the Crypt who narrates the story. So the very next issue is issue 12, and that's when the title changes to Vault of Horror. And the Vault Keeper is the one who narrates the stories through that title. This right here marks his second appearance, so that's why it's a key. But it also is right before the title change, which is why it's called War Against Crime. And we have this, like, horror cover. I mean, we have mummies attacking an archaeologist. So that coupled with it being the first EC horror, plus the grade it's in um, at a 9.0, off-white to white pages just makes it a a coveted book. All right, that's where we got to start this conversation because we're going to crack this today. We're going to dissect this comic book. We're going to learn some things because it's a restored comic book. This is an old label. Can you explain to the community what an old label? That's a term that you hear a lot in the comic book market. Yeah, that term gets thrown around too loosely right now. And um, I want you to take a look at this label specifically. That is a more of a first generation label. Okay, this book was encapsulated January of 2001. That's one year after CGC came on to scene. All right, so we're talking about an early time when they're still trying to figure things out. I mean, there was even a time when their labels didn't have page qualities on them, okay? So this is what it means when it's an old label because the grading was far stricter and so was the restrictions on page quality. There's two ways you can check to see if you're dealing with an old label. The first is... Well, you're dealing with an old label because you've seen them so many times. Over time, CGC changed it you know, for marketing reasons. The other is you can actually look up your comic book, which will help you for a couple different reasons. Yeah, by typing in the number, and you can uh, do that on their homepage. If you scroll down to the bottom, you can put in the certification number, or you can go to cgccomics.com slash cert lookup, and it will pull up general information about the book, its publication date, Uh, the the title of the issue, and when it was uh, encapsulated. So I want to ask you, Jeff, this is a purple label. This is not something you typically bring to this table for us to discuss. I want to know why a purple label, specifically, like why did you buy this? I want to know, was this like part of a deal? What's the purpose behind this comic book? I mean, I already know it's an old label. Right. But looking up the information, which I like to just do because sometimes you'll get free notes that you don't always get. When it validates it. Yeah. Validates it. Maybe to give you a little more information of what's happening on the inside. And I saw the date was 2001, January. That's one year after CDC hit the stand or hit the uh, scene. Right. Okay, so that's that's pretty early. Yeah, that's strict grading, likely. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many were graded by then. That's got to be like the first three, four, five copies. So we're dealing with an old label. That's intriguing enough. But- it's also purple. You mentioned you don't typically pick up purple labeled comics, and that's because this is restored. There are some things that have been done to this comic book and some terminology we're going to be able to go over today. In particular with this book, we're going to discuss um, some of the restoration and what it really means. Okay, We have a cover clean on there. We have a reinforced cover, and we also have tear seals to the centerfold. So we're going to take a look at all that. We're going to really kind of let you guys know how to find these things, you know, differentiate what is, what isn't, and the materials that are used are going to make a big difference. 
that's also going to put a fine line between conservation and restoration. And truly that's different, especially when you talk to specialists. Okay. We spoke to phantom restoration on Instagram. All right. He, he, he's done some work for me and, and he did a great job and, and truly understands the, the, the trade and the art of both restoring books, pressing and, and all that uh, encompasses it. We have the highest graded restored copy on the census right here today. Let's crack it open and take a peek inside the slab. Give me my drill. Give me my blowtorch. It's only worth a thousand dollars. Will you please hurry? All right, I need a razor blade. Like wet. <laughs> is so it wet? Big. It's so hot, man. Uh, no, this is what happens when you deal with comic books. You get all hot. This is what happens when you deal with comics in a sauna. In a sauna. Oh my god, my hands feel attacked. All right, I'm holding the label of War Against Crime number 11, graded at 9.0, because we have cracked it open. We have dissected the comic book, and let's see what we've learned. We have some terms here. It's written on the label. Cover reinforced. What does that mean, Guru? And what does this comic book have? First thing we're going to go over is cover reinforced. That's on there. Now, it doesn't have to just be a cover, okay? And reinforcing a book could be at a centerfold. It could be anywhere inside the book so that it structurally becomes more solid. How do people do that? So there's going to be multiple ways. And they're going to either put you in a conservation type label, which is a gray label, if you end up getting it graded. More preferred more preferred, or a purple label, which is restoration considered. That it, would be like tape and stuff? Yeah, tape won't get you a purple, but it'll be using things that are not archival material. And there's a very fine line between what archival material is. Well, not really a fine line, but there is a distinction between the two. So one's really going to preserve the book long term. Others are going to be more detrimental in long term type concepts. So tape is very bad for a comic, ultimately. There's things called archival tape, which is better. And so when you use certain materials... For books, like another pulp, let's say you make pulp, you're actually making paper to add to this paper, then that's a good thing long term. But you start using foreign substances, certain glues, certain other types of papers, then you're going to get a restored label versus a gray label. So what in particular is going on with this example? Because we have right here, cover reinforced. So generally, when you're looking for that type of stuff, you're going to look for uh, signs of it, which is generally at structural places like the staples. So you want to really look at them for tape, glue, anything really that seems like it's unnatural to the book, whether you're going to feel for maybe a hard, crunchy area. Is it is it a quick tell that there's glue when you're running your fingers up and down? That's why you see a lot of these collectors touch the spine up and down. It's that tactile feeling because it's going to let you know if there's potential restoration. You will not be able to tell if a book is restored or not with 100% confidence without having it in your hands bare because... On top of that, you have to feel the paper quality to see if it's been through anything else like we mentioned there, which is like cleaning. Before we get to cleaning, though, let's show them what's going on with this book in particular. This is a slight professional, so it's very, very small, all right? And it can be very hard to tell. And even now looking at it, I'm not even 100% certain this is it because I don't know the degree of work that was done. But when we look inside, there seems to be this hard line that potentially could have been broken and when you look at it it looks like there should be a white line when you see a break on a cover and you th and there should be white there and there isn't generally something's been done okay if there if there should be a color break and it's not there then either it's been color touched or somehow been altered and that's a very common defect from a comic from that era 
Yeah, I mean, like it's been red. You know, generally if it's red or cracked open, that top, you know, one. and depending if the staples aren't on center, like literally on the spine, they're off, then you're going to get weird lines in certain areas. And this, these staples aren't perfect, but you can tell here when it, when you open it, that there's this line that should, should be a white line from a color break, but it's not. So that's the first thing that you notice here and you should always inspect. All right. The next thing on here that I want to discuss is you alluded to it. The book has been cleaned. Now, we chat about cleaning comics all the time. If you follow me at ComicTom101 on Instagram, sometimes I'm actually doing tutorials, taking my dry erasers, my erasers, and doing some dry cleaning. What's the difference between dry cleaning and a cleaning that would get you this type of label? Because this book has been cleaned. Yeah, so, so the dry cleaning that you've mentioned is generally like removing dirt, surface dirt, certain things on the book and that is not considered restoration okay that's a practice thing that everybody does but this is different with a clean like this it becomes more of a chemical clean it's actually most of the time the book will be disassembled all right and soaked in a liquid it's like some type of solvent gets included right and so what the purpose is of that is to really change the life of the book and the pages. So if it's light, tan, or brittle, it will rejuvenate that and add more life to them again. And that's why most of the time it will be a conserved grade when it comes to cleaning because you're actually uh, increasing the longevity of the book's life now. You're giving it, you're like resuscitating it. But at some cost. How do you know that this has been cleaned? Because man, I can tell you one thing. I can smell it from here. Smell is definitely one way to tell that a book has been cleaned. There's kind of a, it's not an old paper smell. It's more of a bleach and paper mix smell. So when you smell your cover or even the book in certain areas, you will know that it's not normal. This is why you see people smelling their comics, comic fam, on the con floor. We're not just all weird trying to get that musty smell into our sinuses. No, we're actually checking for things there. And another way to, to tell is that their texture of the cover, if it was the cover, because the paper's pulp, okay, we mentioned that. It's And then the, the cover has got a little more clay mix to it, so it gives it that shine, it's different. But that changes, the paper's almost thinner and lighter after it goes through that process. It doesn't feel like a normal Golden Age comic. Yeah, generally it's gonna be a, a, a tad rougher. You know, there won't be as necessarily as much gloss as it should be. And like I said, it's a little bit more, feels a little more light. But that smell and the combination of both are, are just a good way to deduce that something's been done to it. I mean, holding this book, it, it feels like a brand new newborn comic. You know, I mean, the pages are off white, white, might even get a white designation to them. The, look at that. It there's looks like a reprint. It doesn't look like it's old. Yeah, there's no haloing. There's no type of light tanning inside. Nothing crazy like that. This book just feels fresh. It's just not something uh, that's common to have in your hands for this type of age of book. Generally, I'm dealing with like a maybe a very good plus copy of this thing, not a 9.0 feeling you know version of it. I mean, look at that first page if you open yeah, it up. Yeah, check it out, man. Yeah, because like what I'm looking at here is this first page, how gorgeous this Vault Keeper looks like. This page looks like it was just off the press, but it's also a little too nice. Red flags would come up if you're starting to see something this nice. Now, what I want to talk about now is the final thing, the thing that you got to be worried about the most, and that is tear seals. That's added paper. Foreign matter being incorporated into your comic book. What's going on? Generally, the nice thing about tear seals is they're usually pretty easy to identify. Okay, so when we go through this book, we're going to see that in the centerfold where the tear seal is, Okay, you can tell that a piece that looked like it was completely detached has been repaired and inserted back in the proper position. And we'll see here, and when you shine a light on it, and it doesn't have to be a black light, okay, but we have a black light here, which is really helpful for locating foreign other matter and papers added. So when you add paper to these things, like a process called leaf casting, where you're build, basically rebuilding the book, you can identify this. It'll look like a DNA scene or a murder scene at a, at a, you know, on any type of your CSI shows. Yeah, you can see like a line, like this faint outline of shine around this stain that makes me assume that this pay, piece of paper was either uh, added to it or was repaired in some way and then like attached with some type of glue. Yeah, that's the most common material you're going to see is glue. 
um, that's put on here. And generally, you know, if it's if it's uh, amateur, that's what it is. Otherwise, when it's professional, they, like I said, they use proper materials that you can't, you're not going to feel like I don't feel hard glue. I see the the shine of a material on here. But when someone uses glue, you know it's hard, it's crunchy, you can break it. And a little hint here, guys, if you have tear seals on your comics, okay, and if they're actually sealing the, the, the tear, that's going to be restored. But if you break that tear seal, it's no longer going to be a restored book because it's not doing anything. That's right. It's a tip, but it's one you have to be very careful to do because we are talking about collectors making their comic apparently look worse for the sake of bringing them back to the way that they were initially are pre restoration when they were damaged. Yeah. That's a whole nother conversation. Cause when you start talking about uh, trying to remove some of this restoration, it's uh, it's a fine line of what can be really um, brought back to its original state. And you might not like what you see granted. It might be different market value, but you might have a black cover that's got all this color touch to it. It looks amazing. But when you get the color removed, you're either going to have holes in it or huge scrape lines all along the front cover. And that's a that's that's something, since it's your book, you have to make that decision with. And just know that it's not always going to be a slam dunk. Not everything's reversible. Okay? And there's a reason why there's different tiers of between amateurs and professionals. All right. So my last question for you, because we've gone over some great terminology. Has this book been pressed? This book has not been pressed. Okay? Oh, dude, that's pretty cool. Like, I know there's a stain on the inside. It's going to be tough getting above a 9.0 for that grade bump, but there's a chance, man. I, I don't know if it will or won't, whatever. But the nice thing is this has changed. Time has changed with this book. It's no longer um, possibly just a purple. This could be a conserved book now. So there's a potential at a 9.0 conserve opposed to a 9.0 restore because they did not have conserved labels at that time. So depending on what the materials were used, it says professional on there. There's a chance it could be conserved. You know, we'll find out because I'm going to, I'll press it. I'll submit it. I mean, it'll be interesting just to see guys what happens when it comes back. You got to be subscribed, Comic Fam. Hit that like button if you appreciate the fact that the guru is sharing this golden age knowledge. Yo, I think we got to come back to this table, not just for this book, but to chat about some more comic book, you know, hobby stuff. I mean, Maybe we can get, I don't know, a classic Golden Age comic that you're maybe rebuilding. Yeah, guys, there's so much terminology, and really we can get deeper. I'm just trying to give you an intro to it right now, and I'm sure there's a few things I've, I've missed on, but I promise you we'll, we'll get back around. This is my next project right here. I have a Captain America comics number 77. Oh, dude, that's so sick. That copy right there, okay, is missing the last page. Oh, yeah, there's no page on the back here. No, okay. no, that's the coverless one I bought. Oh, there's two. There's two. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am going to Frankenstein this book. All right. So I have an incomplete there. All right. It's missing the back page, not the back cover, but the last page to the book. So I'm either going to remove that cover and a marry it, which means combine it to the coverless copy that's complete. Or because the staples are so off on that one that it's going to be tough. I'm going to just take the first wrap of that complete one and marry it to the one that's missing the back last page. So then you're going to send this to get graded and see if you can get that blue label. I don't know what I'm going to do. No. I'm <laughs> just kidding. No, no, no. no. I, I'm just going to do it for a project. What's the purpose behind this project? And comment, fam, if you want to see him do it, let me know in the comment section below. He's going to bring it back. I've never done it. I think it's just a fun opportunity to just... Take two pieces of history there that I have, make it into one. Yeah, uh, two incomplete pieces of history and make it into one complete one. Captain America, issue 77 by John Romita Sr. Classic cover. Enough of the old stuff. I want to talk about some of this new updates that key collectors got. You have this Marvel DC crossover. That's right. We got some updates to the best comic book app that exists on the market. Use that code TOM101 on Key Collector Comics to unlock one free week subscription of this dope comic app that's going to become such a great asset, a tool in your toolbox of collecting, and it's available on both Android and iPhones. We're chatting about a category of DC Marvel crossover keys for good reason. I couldn't even get through the first couple without going on like hours of research because there's so much history in these key moments. These are the fun moments we get in comics. You wonder how does a Marvel universe end up in a DC universe and then vice versa. But when it happens, it's uh, something to be celebrated because it's fun. I mean, we got to remember these creators, they hung out with each other from time to time. They knew each other. 
and it wasn't so bad to mention it. Like the laws and the uh, the attorneys weren't getting involved. Like nowadays, if you see it, you just you know you're gonna get some kind of class action lawsuit or something ridiculous. So back then, it just wasn't as difficult to do that. But everyone respected each other. It wasn't I don't think anything inflammatory, anything crazy we saw. But man. I don't know. Every time I went through this, like you mentioned, you, you did kind of have to segue and get the whole story behind it. With that said, we have about 10, maybe a little bit more comic books in a list for you. No particular order, but some of our favorite key moments when these crossovers took place. Let's actually start them out with the Inferior Five, a straight up parody team to some heroes of Marvel Comics. Yeah, this is our DC characters in the showcase title. They first appeared. But in Showcase 63, we had this special story arc. That's right. In Showcase 63, we have a Brute Brainerd. Kind of sounds like Bruce Banner. But this right here is a caricature of the Hulk. Probably the least attractive looking version of the character. And you, it's a five beta kappa radiation, man. This is what happens when you get slapped with Greek system radiation, guys. This is hilarious. But you know what? We also have to showcase just a straight up... I would call it an insult to the Marvel heroes in Inferior 5, issue number 10. I mean, look how they just did our man wrong. Some man are getting that ass shot. It's no good. We got a tangled up Mr. Fantastic looking just completely in shambles. I mean, look at Spider-Man, dude. I mean, just total fail, dude. It's <laughs> like he just fell over and like ate it while rollerblading. And check out Superman. Look how majestic. Look how... Uh, powerful he looks above everybody else just standing in a classic pose over these Marvel characters who look like they're tripped over their own feet. But Marvel will be utilizing Clark Kent and Lois Lane in their pages as well. That's right. Let's take a look at how Chris Claremont started this trend. The first time we're going to see these two in a Marvel comic book is in X-Men 98 in a really, really brief corner panel. Okay, they're, they're not named... All right, but that is Clark Kent. Yeah, it's pretty clear that that's who we're looking at. And by the way, this is a great issue if you haven't read it yet, but <laughs> I really recommend it. It was a super fun read, and same with 99. But this would actually start like multiple appearances of this character. This is a Clark Kent who exists in the Marvel Universe. He is a reporter. He is dating someone named Lois Lane, and it's about to be more clear in like other comic books in Marvel canon. I mean, we're going to see him used in over a dozen comic books in Marvel's pages. So Secret Wars 2, number 7. We'll see him again on the television as a news reporter. Because Clark Kent is broadcasted into hell, apparently. <laughs> that's right. But that's not the only page that we see our favorite reporter. No, if you go to uh, Thor 341, okay, Sergeant Fury gives Thor glasses. And as he walks out, he bumps into a character all right, and we see a Lois-like figure say something to the effect of Clark, you need to get up, or, or Clark something. Okay, and that's clearly Clark Kent in his glasses. That's right. And, oh, wait, what's this? Marvel Team Up 79? We see Clark Kent character. Okay, he's not mentioned, but it's Clark, all right, at the Daily Bugle of all places. Peter Parker's place. Yeah, what's he doing in our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man's house right now? Uh, some kind of celebration, Marvel team-up number 79. It's just another cameo. They're just sticking them in. We got to take a look at Excalibur issue number eight coming out in the late 80s. We have straight up a scene where we see Captain Britain just flying into the sky with his gorgeous blonde hair. And then the citizens from the street saying, look, there's a bird, there's a plane, there's a, uh, what is that? And then you see Lois Lane complaining about how you, you just can't go anywhere on the streets without running into a superhero. This is a great scene, okay? Because we see Clark go, isn't New York fantastic, Lois? And then Lois compliments or comments back to Clark. So we actually get confirmation. We're dealing with Lois and Clark in these panels. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to quote her on this, okay? And the way it's laid out, this final panel looks like she's literally looking at the reader and making a statement about Superman. Because she goes, if you've seen one hyperthyroid, egomaniacal, exhibitionist in skin tights, you've seen them all. That's right. She's looking at the reader. This is in a Marvel comic book, throwing shots at DC with DC characters. I love comic books. Let's talk about one more dope comic here on this list. we got Avengers Comics 83. 
That's right. This is actually the first time that we see Valkyrie in comics. That's the first thing. But we also see the debut of this parade. This whole story includes a parade that happens annually in Vermont. And this is one of those moments where I have to just let the comic fam know I'm going to have to come back to this table after more research because this one comic led me to so much more history. This is a parade called the Rutland Halloween Parade that back in the 70s would incorporate superhero costumes as like the main choice of costume for the parade members marching through the streets, being led by characters like Batman and Spider-Man. And naturally, when wrote into the pages of a Marvel comic by Roy Thomas, well, it was post him attending this parade. So in this page, we see individuals who are dressed up as other characters. And check out the representation of this parade in these pages. I mean, this is a full page right here. This is great. You got Doom marching down here. I mean, we even got a representation here of the DC characters. We have Dead Man and we have Batman. And you know what's interesting here? is that we're going to have Neil Adams drawing covers for Avengers shortly after, like maybe 10 issues coming from this book. And those are two Neil Adams, like literally prevalent characters of the late 70s. Yeah, clearly Roy Thomas was influenced by his experience at this parade. And what I would find out is that this parade would then go on to be written into Marvel canon and DC comic books multiple times over the decades by other artists and writers, including Neil Adams and Dennis O'Neill. But that's going to be a conversation for another day. Hit the subscribe button. Let's chat about some Deadpool DC crossover. You know, if there is a character who makes sense to cross over into other publishers and other walls of just conversation. It's Deadpool. Okay, so we're here at Superman and Batman annual number one. Okay, we have them both on the cover, and we have Deathstroke. All right, Deathstroke and Deadpool have a similar look. Yeah, some people actually think that, you know, maybe Deadpool's kind of based off of Deathstroke. So that kind of plays on this notion in this book, and it's really a fun, fun read because Deadpool is his normal self, but you can tell that he's annoying the hell out of Deathstroke in this entire issue. It's the only way you would know it's Deadpool because they didn't actually name him Deadpool in this comic, but how are we told that it's Deadpool? Well, there is a scene where Deadpool is taking his ripped-off arm and beating another character with his own arm, and then slaps it back in place and has it reattach. That's right. He's he's being awful. He's just making jokes. He's being, you know, vulgar. He's being Deadpool. And what's also kind of funny is he's kind of colored like Deathstroke, too. But it's also got the design of Deadpool. Yeah, I mean, he can't die. He's literally being stabbed over and over to the point, and he's annoying Deathstroke so much that Deathstroke is literally commenting how I should just end my own life so I don't have to deal with this anymore. <laughs> that's a way to get rid of Deadpool, right? You just end it yourself. Oh, that's terrible. Okay, so now let me take you back over to another really interesting crossover event that was unintentional. And this is kind of some lore, but it's out there. And this did happen. We have Aquaman 56 and another comic book we got to get on the screen too that are, that are connected. Submariner 72. Very strange that these, these two comic books were connected, especially coming out years apart from one another. But let's get into it. We have a comic book that is a hidden crossover event because of a villain that was first appearing in this Aquaman issue. It's this algae-like creature that starts taking over the world that gets resolved by the end of this Aquaman book by getting thrown into space and having it explode. All right. It goes up into flames. But what's really interesting is that just a couple years later, we have a writer, an editor staff. His name is Steve Skeetis. And unbeknownst to him, he utilized this very villain in the Submariner issue 72 narrative that he was working on, thinking presumably that it was fair game. These writers and artists, they hopped ship. They would go from one place to the other. So this writer thought he was utilizing a character that was that was okay to use. And he brought it into Marvel canon, making it the first unintentional Marvel crossover of any character. That's weird. I don't know why he didn't just Google it. I mean, that makes no sense to me. Well, if he would have, he would have known that Submariner dealing with this fungus creature that came from space actually came from a different Atlantean. 
I find it a little hilarious that of all creatures to like be stolen by another universe, it's got to be an algae creature. I mean, like, yes, what do we need to do to to strike fear into heroes? Another algae creature. It's how you know for sure that he just made a mistake because, like, what are the odds that it would be another fungal space alien that would cause this creature? But I digress because we got to talk about Quasar and wait, the Flash. Yeah, talk about silly. Okay, so this one's going to be a little bit of a stretch, but it's there. Oh, for sure it's there. We're dealing with speedsters in the Marvel Universe. Dealing with speedsters, exactly. And like anytime you think of speedster, it's the Flash from the DC Universe. But we're going to get a race that happens in Quasar number 17. But a character appears in the pages named Buried Alien or Alien, however you want to pronounce it. And how close is that to Barry Allen? This character has amnesia. All right. And he doesn't know his own name. And he says it kind of sounds like that. Yeah, it specifically mentions that he forgot and he came through another dimension because of how fast he can run. But it sounds like Buried Alien. I can't remember my name. Yeah, and he's got crimson shorts on. He's kind of got almost like this lightning bolt looking belt, but really it's just a torn piece of material, which isn't an accident the way it's drawn. All right, he's got his yellow boots on. I mean, it's got to be meant to be Flash. Absolutely. And what's also intriguing was this other comic book that you found that honestly, I'm hoping someone in the comments section can fill in the gaps with because I was surprised to see the CGC label. I was surprised to see that this is considered a random factoid respected in the key collector market. We have Spider-Man Marvel team up featuring Barry Allen and Iris West? Yeah, so it's Marvel Team Up number 121. Okay, it's got an issue of a speedster in it. Spider-Man and Human Torch on the cover. Marvel Comics, what's going on on the cover? Yeah, so the cover also has first cameo appearance of The Flash. Okay, Barry, not even The Flash, of Barry Allen and Iris West. And this is what it says on the CGC label. And it's known in the community. I looked on the internet and you're going to see eBay searches that say it. You're also going to see random like sites that mention, yeah, this is a fun little factoid. It's a it's a key appearance for Flash collectors. But I, I could find nothing else about it. Why are they on the cover? I couldn't find them even in the comic book. Well, it's a speedster issue. So it makes sense to just poke a little bit like, you know, I mean, that is that looks like Barry Allen's The Flash. All right. The Silver Age version of it for the most part. And I'm assuming maybe there's some hidden story we don't know. Maybe the artist mentioned that somewhere. Maybe the original artwork's out there, but it's not in the interior pages. You don't see them inside, so there's no validation of these are those characters. But it is recognized by CGC on their label that that's their appearance. Comic fam, these types of comics have amazing history. And when you go through them, you end up finding other comic books, other random pieces of like information that makes you want to buy and hunt and, and add comics to your collection. I'm going to be looking through this category. You should too. Remember to use that code TOM101. You help support the show, but you're going to learn a lot about comic collecting. Instead of learning about comic collecting, let's learn about some of our viewer comments here. Dude, we messed up. All right. We made a huge mistake. Comic fam, I'm sorry. I am so sorry that we don't know what the vision looks like. Okay. Well, I'm talking about our covering of Maestro. Okay. We're chatting about that trophy room and I got... More than these members here, but they were just the first three that I was able to pull up. Anthony Perron, Benjamin D, Jerry Rowe, all saying, yo, that head in the back of the trophy room, that's not Silver Surfer, guys. That's a gem in the middle of his forehead. That's the vision. Don't you know that back in the early 90s and 91, the vision was white? I know now. That's right. (laughs) I mean, pull up Avengers 348. That's got to be around the era. It's a classic Vision cover that I didn't prep prior to this conversation. Just kidding. And yeah, Vision's white. We made a mistake. I saw Beast picture there in the body, and I just really went to Silver Surfer's head. Dude, at least you didn't call Professor X Mr. X. (laughs) How many years in college did Professor X go for me to make that mistake? It's not acceptable. (laughs) But hey, this is what you get when you subscribe to the channel and you hit that like button. But how cool was it to go through that trophy room, seeing the comments, and actually you know, taking another look at some stuff that we had missed from the past? I had to give it a second look. I was like, how did I gaff on the vision's head duh but while i'm here (laughs) let me take a look at this a little bit more and realize that in this panel there's a sentinel head which is obvious but right on top of the sentinel head are the rocks that form the thing 
Dude, didn't realize, because, like, it makes sense, too. Like, the first thing is, we had the bricks in the front, which, of course, was parts of the Avengers headquarters. Um, then we also have the green brick, which supposedly was kryptonite courtesy of the colorist. Why would there be more orange blocks behind them if it wasn't the thing? It makes perfect sense. And the way they were shaped, you know, more kind of like, not brick yeah. brick, but blocks. Like That's right. His shapes are. Dude, totally missed that freaking Hellstrom's trident is right in the back. Yeah, I was going down the DC route thinking Submariner, but it makes more sense. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, Hellstrom, duh. Absolutely. And, of course, this was like, it was there, but I just didn't see it until someone in the comments mentioned it. That's Ghost Rider's bike back there. Yeah, dude. He's got his chopper just parked there in the corner. You know, you, you see the headlights and, and the frame of it, and you, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, that's his ride. We're talking about future imperfect. And I want to remind the community, if you go to ComicTom101.com or hit the description, you can join our mystery mail call comic book subscription service. It's a way for you to support the show, but we also send you comics every month. And we have the origin of Maestro. This version of the Hulk in this very comic book available to every member who joins this month, courtesy of Marvel Comics and cover artist Valerio Gian Giordano. This is a sweet cover, guys. I mean, it even made me swear last week. You guys heard it here, all right, man? My mouth was just a potty mouth with damn, 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 this is a hot cover, okay? So help support the Mystery Mail Call, guys, if you can. But I want to reach out to a comment that Daniel Woodhouse has put out there, all right? He would love to have that Ruby Negan Lives cover. Imagine how it would feel is what he said. Dude, I'm glad we got that podcast out in time for the comic fam to attend the Skybound event to see if they could get a chance at getting this variant. And from what I understood, it's going out in two different ways. And we're going to talk about this comic book for a second because, oh my gosh, have they gone out? Do they exist? Yup. And are they selling for crazy amounts? You betcha. Okay, this comic book is went out to people that supposedly just followed the member from Skybound. And he reached out to him via DM saying, hey, you were infected by the virus. And they're just getting the comics. The other way that we believe them to be going out is in the Walking Dead boxes that they're selling throughout the con and probably throughout San Diego Comic-Con virtual. So you may get them in there, but this is unconfirmed at this point. But what I do know is they're hitting eBay. Do you see these comic sales? Yep, we did see some sales. And we're seeing some auctions right now, okay, with still multiple days left. And it's already at $900. We've seen completed sales up to $1,500 for these things already. What's intriguing is that there's a print count that is being floated around in the community. A low 500 supposedly printed. I was not able to find validation that that's the case. But what I was able to find is multiple tweets from the Skybound representative showing that he had a handful, maybe this amount, a nice little stack that weren't bagged and boarded, that he was handling raw. And it leads me to believe that at least that stack would be prone to damages. They are out there. And if there were around 500, it would lead to the title descriptions being accurate. Because what's being put in eBay sale listings is that this comic book is potentially the rarest Walking Dead comic to ever be produced. And I think that may be right. It's got to be up there. I can't think of any other print count lower than 500. Man, this is a story you got to follow, especially with SDCC happening this week right now. So we're going to see more hit the market. Is it a book I'm going to jump into? Eh, probably not right now at those prices. But if it's a gift I'm getting for free, yeah, I might very well be putting that on the market, cashing out and putting it towards something else. I, can, I mean, maybe even a, a Walking Dead 1. Dude, those numbers are getting close to Walking Dead 1 numbers. So this is one of those moments where it's like, hey... I see the value. I see what people are paying. You know, I'm not oblivious to this type of stuff. But as a collector, I'll take a look at it for what it is. It's going to be about whether you're buying for scarcity or if you're buying for really keyworthiness. Because Walking Dead 1, that, that holds the cake for keyworthiness. You're not going to convince me that a Negan 1 that came out in 2020 is going to take the cake of the most coveted Walking Dead collectible. Heck, I would rather put my money behind a Walking Dead 19. But even that comic book is worth staggeringly less than this red foil variant. Comic fam, what do you think about this? I'm not buying it. But dang, 
what if these print count numbers are even lower? What if the rumors are right that a number of these went to staff at Skybound? I, I'm going to be watching where this comic ends up. It may hit the top 10. It's going to be a really fun book to monitor. I want to go into this next comment, but this is more appropriate for Fire Guy Ryan. Yeah, let's see if he's available. Huh, sure change. Did anyone else see that spider crawl into Ryan's headset earpiece <laughs> thing? This was from the last podcast that I kind of hijacked and, and jumped into when, when Jeff was here. And I came on and did a spot about nudity or something, I think. And yeah. apparently, according to James Pennington, there was a spider in my, in my headphones the whole time. So uh, <laughs> I need to go back and check. Uh, if, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight or any other night ever. So uh, <laughs> if, if someone wants to screenshot that for me, that would be fantastic. And let me know, James <laughs> Bennington, if if there's a spider in my brain now. <laughs> and maybe that's why I keep getting these weird headaches. <laughs> that's a great comment. We got It's keep, a great comment. The really world needs to, Ryan needs to know. Ryan, we need these comments to keep coming. I man, need to know. Because I'm learning so much about things that we don't see. It's kind of like. Like they might be giants. There's a there's a scarecrow waving his arms behind me when no one's looking. You know. I don't know that reference. Yeah, someone did. This is a comment from William Wilson from our Comic Karma video the other day. Great Comic Karma this week. Gotta love it. P.S. The Jerky Boys were hilarious back yes. in the day. You gotta check them out, Ryan. Okay, so a couple things. Jerky Boys, dope. Mentioned them on the podcast. Some people remembered that this was a thing. Now. I want to bring this back to a live show that we did recently where we were chatting about Medic, which have you read that yet? No. Okay. Have you read more than one comic book in the last month? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. This is three issues and this is a problem that you haven't read this comic yet. But here's the thing. I have zero expectation of Ryan to read my recommendations. I, I read things. I do. I know you do. But I've known you for quite a long time and I just want to make sure the community knows that this is like a real thing I have. With this gentleman here, one of my best can friends. I, can I safely mention here that I'm not like this just with you? Yeah. My brother will also tell you that he'll he'll recommend things to me, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I never oh, yeah. do. This is, this is Ryan, like my friend. This is how uh, this is how you handle consuming content, and that's totally fine. But I wanted to throw that out here to the podcast community who follow us here and who stick around for the after show, which is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. We keep the conversation going after the camera shut off. That these recommendations that I tell you for a year to, to read and to enjoy or to watch, it's authentic. I'm still telling my friend to check this stuff out. And the Jerky Boys made that list. And I think there's more content that needs to be made about you getting caught up on things that I recommend. Do you remember like a year ago when I was like, hey, Tom, there's this cool scary movie I just watched called Hereditary. You should check it out. Which is why I give you... You watched it like within two days. You're right, dude. You know what? I did. You're a good friend. And I'm a terrible person. And But here's the thing. You gave me the gift of Hereditary. So that's how... It's kind of like... That's the thing with Ryan. Although he may not watch all or read all the things you recommend the one time he does give you a recommendation that's really worthy of a ryan recommendation it's badass i have good recommendations people i have an excellent taste all right well why don't we get Which into why i know anything tom suggests to me is going to be you know inferior sub exactly like fine i guess i'll try something that tom says is good yeah and if it's, it's three issues it's a 6.0 there you go <laughs> all right comic fam let's chat about some real first appearances ryan it's been a minute since we chatted about this it's uh, been many more minutes since I chatted about it, too. Hit the subscribe button, comic fam. We talk about collectible comics, and we like to dive deep. You know, We like to go backwards in time, trying to figure out, really, these, these moments in comic history, how far back do they go with characters? Because there's a, a thing that happens in comic books. There's typically teasers. There's things that allude to the next issue and it makes these types of statements of when's the first time this happened you know kind of have some best way to put it options sometimes there's very clear cut this person appeared first right here other times it's not that clear and i think this is one of those second times all right batman beyond let's talk about terry mcginnis back in 1999 this animation that linked to the BTOS universe, the Batman the Animated Series universe on television, it was a huge hit. And they brought a short six issues to the market post the success of this show. 
and it made the debut of the Terry McGinnis Batman, this futuristic Batman happened in the pages of the comics for the first time. Right. He was a popular TV show character, so they wanted to transfer that popularity over to comic books by just a, a little miniseries, just to test the waters, see how Terry McGinnis does on paper. And yeah. And it worked out pretty well. It was like a rendition of the show, similar to how uh, Harley Quinn was introduced, right? I mean, it's kind of a, a similar key situation here. However... This right here would mark the first appearance of Terry McGinnis. It would also mark first appearance in costume in the Batman Beyond costume that is in the second issue of this series because we'll remind everybody like that origin story features Bruce Wayne in the costume. Right, yeah. The first issue, it doesn't have Terry McGinnis dressed up as Batman Beyond. Spoiler alert. <laughs> no, it's all, it's all Bruce Wayne and it's it's kind of giving the reader like you know a little bit of understanding as to what's going on, why are we in the future, you know, why is Batman old? So we have now this thing that takes place in, in, in comics and collecting. We have an animated series rendition in comics, and then we have the key worthiness of when this character gets adapted in DC continuity into like the comic book world. And why would someone care about that? Because that's when that's where like the real stuff happens. Like the animated universe is its own little separate continuity, kind of like the Marvel Ultimate Universe back in the day. Like there's the mainstream comic book universe where all of the main things are happening and then you know, almost like a, like an like an elseworlds kind of way there's just stuff that happens on the periphery that doesn't usually apply or matter in a sense so they had to bring terry mcginnis and batman beyond over into the the mainstream continuity here so now we're gonna fast forward what 11 years superman batman annual number four it's like a one-shot story it's just like a own standalone tale that features batman beyond like, these are the pages of Batman Beyond, but this is different, all right? This is such a long time after, and it's not the animated world. Let me read you the first page of this story. Please. The very bottom of the first page, it says, A visit to the world of Batman Beyond. I mean, it's very clear there in text that we are getting a unique story that features Terry McGinnis that is being mentored by a Bruce Wayne. This right here predates Batman 700, thus making it the first time we see Terry McGinnis in this similar origin story that we all know outside of the animated series. Cool. What's the problem then? Well, the problem is that between the animated series and this issue, Batman Beyond shows up in comic books. Yeah. All right, see, and now it's going to get a little dicey. Yeah. Okay, but let's take it back. When does it happen the first time? So you have to go back to 2005 in this the same comic book run, this Superman, Batman, but we're going back to issue 22 and issue 23, 2005. A beautiful time. <laughs> That's right. Issue 22, we see a cameo appearance, and issue 23, we see full-on appearance of Batman Beyond. It is in costume. It's the right symbol. It's Batman from the future. This is a story, though, however, that goes out of its way to name the character. And why is that very important? Because the name that this Batman is called is Tim. Ooh, Tim. And, and that would make sense because, mind you, Tim Drake was Robin at the time. But this name makes a very very big difference to collectors because that means that this key appearance is standalone for maybe a batman beyond key moment not the terry mcginnis batman beyond full appearance which really is what matters the most because that character is the character that holds that batman beyond mantle similar to a peter parker holding the spider-man mantle is it kind of like a barry allen or like a wally west like two different flashes exactly like it matters for that particular character and that superhero that they become so this is like a separate completely different version of batman beyond that is a future version of tim drake and not this completely new terry mcginnis character that they came up with correct and where it gets even more interesting is that in the last decade there are rumors on the internet that this was a mistake. There's actually a, f a huge thread on CGC, like their, their forums, where it says that there has been someone who witnessed a quote during a panel in 2007 that 
they said that this was a mistake, that they didn't mean to say Tim in that bubble. I was supposed to say Terry. So there is this kind of movement happening that's like, hey, should this be the case if it was done in error? Now, I found it pretty fun because Nick from Key Collector actually was able to source DC Direct, like this toy line that was released post this series, specifically in like this 2005 run here, um, this short appearance of Batman Beyond. And the toy run indeed was named a Tim Drake Batman Beyond. Hmm. So kind of like further gives it credence that it wasn't a mistake or if it was at the very least, they rolled with it. Or if it was a mistake, they made the mistake twice in the same way. And I also found some more information too because because it's been so long and there's been a lot of conversations about this, there's multiple websites that actually credit a Terry McGinnis appearance. Some don't. Some say it's Tim Drake because really collectors are the ones that care the most and this is some like some deep cut kind of stuff. But I was able to find a wiki entry about this rumor and there's like a really nice list of the notes from this entire panel back in 2007. It's not very common that you get this type of uh, documentation for a one-off panel at a WonderCon. And the only time that the words Terry McGinnis even shows up in this transcript, it wasn't to talk about the error they made. You'd think that would make the transcript. No. The only thing it says is, Didio hinted that Terry McGinnis from Batman Beyond might be showing up in the future. That's pretty generic. Right. Generic yeah. and has nothing to do with the fact that, oh, we already brought him into the world. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't feel like it was a mistake to me, but that's just me. So we have issues 22 and 23. Batman Beyond Key? Sure. Terry McGinnis as Batman Beyond full appearance? Not so much. And then we also have another comic book that actually has to make its way in like in between this narrative that we're laying out for the community. Because in just in a couple of years, we have Countdown Final Crisis issue number 21, we have straight up cameo shots. So in between the Superman Batman issues 22 and 23 in 2005 and the annual number 4 in 2010 there was a, another another issue here in 2007 this countdown to Infinite Crisis 21 which gets you know th th these are all pretty weird and like multiversey but this one starts to develop Earth 12 which is a side universe where everything is just 50 years in the future. So they're in Earth-12 in this in this issue, and they happen to glimpse Batman Beyond. And what's very fun is that they go out of their way to have a conversation amongst, amongst characters speculating who's beneath the mask. And they say this, is it Tim or is it Dick? They don't say Terry. Terry's not part of this conversation. They guess. You know, but they don't know. We don't get clarification. That's very important because we don't know who this Batman Beyond actually was in these pages. Mind you, this has a October date on the cover, and the date of the 2007 WonderCon that we are discussing in this conversation happened in March that very year. Maybe this was the appearance that was being discussed. I don't know, but we wouldn't see Batman Beyond until the pages of the annual near five years later. It's weird how something like an like a like a typo or like an error can kind of spark such a debate like this over a first appearance. Uh, it really does, and people get heated about it. People want to know where they should be putting their money as it pertains to speculation, but it goes even deeper when it comes to no, like what should be the comic that holds the most keyworthiness. There's almost like a pride in having the answer right. That some collectors who aren't even collecting Batman Beyond, like they won't even care about this issue, but they feel it like needing to be correct so much that it actually causes like some divisiveness in the community, you know, some separation, some frustrated people. Yeah, people don't like to be wrong. You know, it's not a good feeling. So that's why we got to go by dates, man. The obvious answer, I think, is if they're going to do like a Batman Beyond featured film at some point, they're going to do Terry McGinnis as as the character. Right, they're gonna want to make it simple, and not, and not have to explain Tim Drake or, or who that is. Like the average movie goer doesn't even know who Tim Drake is. So 
I don't know. Terry, Terry McGinnis, it makes the most sense. And that's kind of like why I think it's important that we even have a conversation like this in the first place. Doesn't that make sense? Like you have people who are looking at comic books literally with pages of Batman Beyond in them five years prior to what most collectors say is a full first appearance. And they're going, yeah, doesn't matter to me. Like there's that that raises questions. It makes you go, wait, what's going on? And that's why these terms and why these things in particular matter. Comic fam, you should let us know in the comments what you think about Batman Beyond. What do you think about Terry McGinnis? What do you think about Tim Drake? Is any of this is any of this worthwhile? Does this matter? Does it matter to you? Is Batman Beyond cool? Batman Detective Comics 1000, you can win it. Comic book therapy. You won the giveaway. You won the black cat by J. Scott Campbell. Oh, he liked, he subscribed, and he commented, and now he's getting this comic book. Comic fam, we appreciate you. Stay tuned to the after show, and we'll see you again very soon. As always, responsibly. Enough said. <laughs>